This video is for all of the married Muslim men out there who may be struggling with your relationships. Is your marriage, or marriages, with your wife, or wives, on the rocks? Are you finding no happiness when you're plowing your field, so to speak? Is managing your female property more trouble than it's worth? I suggest it's because you have strayed too far from Muhammad's example and sacred Islamic law. So, to help out, I present to you Five Steps to a Happy Muslim Marriage Step 1. Marry Young Nope. Younger. 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 <laughs> Muslim sources repeatedly state that Muhammad had sexual intercourse with Aisha when she was 9 years old. She is constantly described with terms like young, immature, and prepubescent. And we're told she was playing with dolls when she was taken to Muhammad's house. But some of you Muslim men may be hesitant. You know that there are different standards for you and Muhammad. You've read Al-Qurtubi, and you see that Muhammad got certain sexual privileges that other Muslim men don't have. For example, if Muhammad wanted another woman, it was obligatory for her husband to divorce her. Also, Muhammad had a bunch of wives, unlike other Muslim men who are limited to four at a time. However, if you're in doubt about whether the privilege of marrying a young girl applied only to Muhammad, let me ask you a question Muhammad once asked one of his companions. Jabir said, When I got married, Allah's messenger said to me, What type of lady have you married? I replied, I have married a matron. He said, Why don't you have a liking for the virgins and for fondling them? Jabir also said, Muhammad said, Why didn't you marry a young girl so that you might play with her and she with you? Clearly, only a true prophet of God would ask such a question. Why not marry a young girl so that you might play with her? Unfortunately, Muhammad didn't say how you're supposed to play with your young wives. So, if you need ideas, I suggest starting with a dollhouse and see where it goes from there. And of course, in the opinions of numerous Muslim commentators across the centuries, the waiting period in Surah 65-4, which is required for divorce if the marriage is consummated, applies to prepubescent girls as well. Ibn Kathir tells us that the waiting period for the old is the same as for the young who have not yet reached the age of menstruation. And the filthy ignoramus Maldudi gleefully proclaims that the Quran allows both marriage and intercourse with prepubescent girls. So there you have it, Muslim men. Marrying young is allowed by your prophet and your God, as if there's even a relevant difference between the two. So go do step one. Marry a young one. This is sure to add an extra dynamic into your other failing marriages. Who knows, your other wives might even enjoy babysitting. Step 2. Use your conjugal rights. Remember, in the depraved manual of sacred Islamic law, we are told that the man has full sexual rights to the woman, and she is not to refuse, going right along with what Muhammad said in the Hadith. Stipulations most entitled to be abided by are those with which you are given the right to enjoy the woman's private parts. Further, Islamic law says men don't have to support their wives if the women fail to hold up to their end of the sexual bargain. But since the man can have multiple wives, he can refuse sex with them accordingly. However, under no circumstances does a man's refusal to have sex with his wives mean that the wives can refuse to have sex with the husband. If a wife refuses to have sex, that constitutes rebellion in Islamic law. And we have a solution for that problem. Step 3. Beat them. Now this is not a detailed tutorial on how to beat your wife. That is an issue far too complicated for me. So I'm going to leave that to the Muslim scholars. Just like there's a technique to swinging a baseball bat or a golf club, I'm certain there's a technique involved here as well. Surely you're not supposed to just step up to the proverbial plate and start swinging that wife-beating stick haphazardly. How do you hold the stick? And how fast do you swing it? Or maybe it's more of a bare-handed beating. Or maybe you use some boxing gloves. Who knows? But thankfully, there are some very helpful YouTube videos with authorities from the religion of wife beating to help answer some of these questions. But for our purposes, when we think of physical discipline, perhaps the first thing that comes to mind is spanking a child. This works especially well since... According to Islamic law, your wife may actually be a child. However, does physical discipline still apply in the unfortunate event your wife is an adult? Sure does. Allah clarifies. 
But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, advise them, if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. But how do you know when exactly you can beat her? Anytime she's being rebellious, which includes all kinds of things like leaving the house without permission or refusing sex with the husband. Notice how Islamic law very diligently looks out for the sexual interest of men, just like Allah in Muslim paradise where he's prepared large-breasted virgins. But you don't want to wait until paradise. You want it now. You've tried to apply step two, use your conjugal rights. Your wife for the night has refused, so you've beaten her. Step three, it was a stern thrashing, and you hit her multiple times. But you didn't cause any blood to flow or break any bones, so you're within the limits of Sharia law, which clarifies what Allah left exceedingly vague in the Quran. But now that you've applied step three, she is definitely not in the mood to give you those conjugal rights. Two options. First, you can threaten her, just like Muhammad and Allah, which again seem curiously like the same person. The angels are also concerned about the sexual well-being of Muslim men. If a woman refuses sex, the angels will curse her until morning. Now, it's unclear exactly what this threat is. In other words, okay, so the angels will curse her. Then what? You might have to embellish this a little bit. You could suggest maybe that the curse involves your wife not having a 10th birthday party, or the local toy store will be out of dollhouse accessories. I don't know, just come up with something. It shouldn't be too difficult to convince a child. But if this doesn't work, Allah has another option. It is an enormity for a person not to take the rights of Allah, the Most High, and His commands seriously. That is the wrong reference. Let's try this one. Can't get those conjugal rights? Remember, Allah permitted you to have sex with your wives and your female slaves. So just to review, step two requires Muslim men to have their conjugal rights. If your wife doesn't comply, beat and threaten her. And remember to always keep some sex slaves on the side in case of an emergency. Step four, the two C's, cut and covered. Muhammad endorsed the circumcision of girls. He was as vague in the Hadith as Allah typically is in the Quran. Thus we find in Islamic law disagreements about whether it's required or recommended and how much of a girl's private parts should be cut out. And as is well known, the translation in Reliance of the Traveler is intentionally misleading. Section E43 states circumcision is obligatory for women by removing the clitoris. The Hanbalis and Hanafis disagree. The health benefits of this procedure for girls and women can be described as follows. This procedure has no health benefits for girls and women. The procedures can cause severe bleeding, problems urinating, cysts, infections, infertility, complications in childbirth, and increased risk of newborn deaths. I guess Muhammad, with all of his scientific knowledge, just couldn't figure this one out. It is a violation of human rights of girls and women. Of course, whether or not this is a violation of women's rights in Islam can be debated since you can't violate something you never had in the first place. The second C, keep those things covered like Umar told you to. Narrated Umar, my lord agreed with me in three things. What's the second thing, Umar? And as regards the veiling of women, I said, O Allah's messenger, I wish you ordered your wives to cover themselves from the men because good and bad and blah, blah, blah. So the verse of the veiling of women was revealed. All Umar had to do was drop a quarter into Muhammad's vending machine of Quranic verses and out popped a revelation from Allah on the veiling of women. In spite of the arbitrary and self-serving way this verse was revealed, Muslim men should not lose sight of its importance. In the unlikely event that your wife heals fully from her circumcision and actually feels like going out of the house, the nakedness of a woman that she is forbidden to reveal differs in the Shufi school according to different circumstances. When outside the home on the street, it refers to the entire body. And if your wife doesn't like being wrapped up in a sack, she's not allowed to leave the house without your permission anyway. So, who cares? Now, go put these four steps into practice, and I'm sure you'll be on your way to a healthy, happy, fulfilling marriage or marriages in no time. Back again? Steps one through four failed you? No problem. Step five, have the same attitude towards women as Umar, Allah, and Muhammad. Narrated Umar, my Lord agreed with me in three things. What's the third thing, Umar? Once the wives of the Prophet made a united front against him, why would they do that? 
Umar said, it may be that if the Prophet divorces you, Allah will give him better wives than you. So the verse was revealed. And here it is, Surah 66, verse Umar. Perhaps his Lord, if he divorced you all, would substitute for him wives better than you. So if it's not working out, just divorce them and start over. Start over how? Start over with whom? If you're asking those questions, you fail to see the miracle of Islamic law. If you get to step five and fail, you start over at step one, marry young. Thus, you can never exhaust this simple five-step process for a healthy marriage. If you fail the first time, just repeat the same process over and over again, expecting different results. When I reflect on the rugged beauty of Islamic law, I am continually thankful that Muhammad came along and brought the Arab world out of its former age of ignorance, enlightened them, and gave them a beautiful example to follow. An example that, if closely abided by, is sure to have the same result as it has in the past, producing many more backward, dysfunctional people, relationships, and cultures for years to come.